Okay, so uh, today we will discuss three major issues in uh, Arbuthnot as uh, potential university uh, issues uh, for your examinations. The first is how Pope self uh, creates a self fashioning or how uh, this poem is autobiographical. This is the first uh, uh, major issue that we will discuss. The second is how Pope creates a gallery of characters in Arbuthnot. And thirdly, is what is the structure of the poem. These are the three major issues which uh, you need to focus on while you are discussing Arbuthnot. So I'll straight away launch into the first uh, discussion uh, and argue that uh, of all his major poetry, Pope offers a glimpse into his autobiographical self by fashioning a self in Arbuthnot and commenting on the literary and personal uh, encounters that he had uh, in the poem. But we will also argue that Pope presents a specially poetic, cleansed, and fluid version of himself. I repeat, uh, a specially poetic, cleansed, and fluid version of himself. This is going to be our initial argument. We'll then proceed to argue that Pope, being a Roman Catholic and being of uh, birth from a gentlemanly family rather than nobility, was always placed in a position of isolation within the literary milieu. Additionally, his physical features and the long disease that he suffered from the tuberculosis of the spine or POTS disease meant that Pope was always a target of virulent personal and poetic attacks. These are factors that provoke Pope to create an image of himself or a fashioned self of himself within the poem, within Arbuthnot. While the poem was occasioned by Arbuthnot's terminal disease, it had already been written in patches. And therefore, we can argue that Pope was working on this self-fashioning considerably well from the 1720s onwards. Arbuthnot merely sees a culmination of that attempt. Pope's self-fashioning is marked by a self-reflection, self-possession, and self legitimization. I repeat, Pope's self-fashioning is marked by a self-reflection, self-possession, and self-legitimation. It is equally marked by the desire to establish around himself a circle of virtuous men and around it to fashion the self of a virtuous crusader, an emulator of the classics, a mature moral arbiter, and ultimately the key figure of English satire in the 18th century. What is interesting you can argue next, is that Pope does not negate his deformity. He talks about his long disease, his life, 
and proceeds to add that despite his deformity, he becomes a crusader against social and aesthetic deformity. Thus, his motive is that he will be to virtue only, and this is within quotes, to virtue only and her friends, a friend, unquote, and within quotes once again, ask you what provocation I have had, ask you what provocation I have had, next line, the strong antipathy of the good to the bad, the strong antipathy of the good to the bad, close quotes. In Arbuthnot, therefore, Pope creates a series of portraits, but prior to that, he initiates the poem dramatically with the suggestion that he is in a state of siege, where he becomes the target of every budding poet and dramatist. Thus, this image of his grotto at Twickenham being the epicenter of satire and literature of the 18th century is continuously harped by several categories of literary artists, poets, dramatists, and people who seek his patronage, his prefaces, and his money. What is interesting is how Pope negotiates with these various classes of people. He can shun the dishonest. He can be polite or equally brash. And he can equally refuse his flatterers. In fact, Pope suggests that his flatterers are more dangerous than his literary enemies because they create, because they create a falser portrait of himself, a falser portrait of himself. Interestingly, it is within this flattery that Pope carves out for himself the image of Alexander and, of course, that of Horace. In doing so, there is the subtle hint that Pope becomes the literary inheritor of the Horatian tradition. It can then argue that Arbuthnot's role here is interesting because he features minimally in the text. But his argument for moderation and for toning down the virulence of the satire by mentioning types, 
rather than individual figures suggests or reiterates the Horatian presence in Pope's self, in Pope's selfhood. It is also interesting that it's also interesting that in several sections of the poem, Pope reiterates his commitment to poetic correctness, the moderation of taste, and the commitment to virtue. There are individual references to Horace's dictums. For example, keeping the poem, keeping a poem nine years, which once again supplants Pope as Horace's inheritor. You can then argue that, in fact, Pope's catalogue of friends and his motivation to write poetry is key to Arbuthnot. Pope argues that he writes poetry by compulsion and by nature, and therefore claims the status of a genius. Equally, he gathers around him friends like Etheridge Swift, and of course claims the literary blessings of Dryden. Therefore, Arbuthnot argues, or this is the poem Arbuthnot argues, about a Horatian tradition of satire that runs from the classical to the Anglo-Latin imagination through Dryden, Swift, Gay, and finally reaches a culmination in Pope. Within this self-fashioning, Pope also sees himself as nursing neglected genius, especially in the figure of Gay. Thus Pope is presenting himself not only as a scourge of falsehood, his self-portrait is that of the moderate, moderate figure who, who values virtue, taste, literary, merit and also is a protector of neglected good poets. If this is the thesis of the self that Pope creates, then he also creates several antitheses. The antithesis are important because they are what Pope is not. They are what Pope is not. The primary figure here is Addison, who is obliquely referred to as Atticus, the preeminent poet and dramatist who gathers around him a coterie and is marked by envy. By contrast, 
Pope is isolated and marked by generosity. In the figure of Buffo, Pope criticizes the system of patronage which survives on ego and therefore gathers around itself a range of poor flattering poets. By contrast, Pope is isolated and refuses to surrender his independence and commitment to patronage. In the most virulent picture or virulent portrait of Sporus or Lord Harvey, Pope launches into a scathing attack on falsehood, chaos, sexual ambiguity, and poetic instability. Sporus's fragility, Sporus's fragility is characterized by an equal fragility in terms of personality and poetic ta talent, personality and poetic talent, so that physical deformity can actually lead to both spiritual and poetic deformity. This is to be contrasted with Pope, whose physical deformity does not deny, does not deny his commitment to virtue. Therefore, you can argue that Pope's self-fashioning is also directed towards the allegations against his parentage made by Harvey and Lady Mary Wortley Montego. Pope presents his father as gentlemanly, honest, and marked by a commitment to his religion, while his mother is marked by sobriety, this is in contrast to the hypocrisy that Pope observes within his literary rivals. There are numerous references, of course, to rival poets and dramatists, including Theobald and Sibber. And these references seek to bolster his reputation as a technically perfect poet who is welded as a crusader against any form of vice or poetic inadequacy. To conclude then, to epistle to Arbuthnot remains probably the most intimate
and autobiographical of Pope's literary output. It is here that he presents a deliberately magnified and sanitized version of his self, justifying himself as a votary of virtue and good sense, moderate in his satire, gentlemanly by birth, and claims literary preeminence within contemporary society. Arbuthnot, or the epistle to Dr. Arbuthnot, paradoxically brings together isolation and community, deformity, and cure, satire, and praise. But through the portrait of himself, his friends and detractors, and even that of Arbuthnot, the poem becomes an act of self-reflection and self-legitimation. Right, so that's the first issue as to how Pope presents his selfhood in Dr. Arvatnot. Now uh, comes the question of his creation of several portraits. Now, this I've discussed in great detail. What you need to also do is, you know, catalog these uh, these details. You know, you have to suggest that uh, Pope's uh, Arbuthnot progresses through a gallery of characters. And this gallery includes Pope himself, Arbuthnot, his literary friends, and his literary detractors. However, these portraits do not merely or are not merely representations of Pope's personal universe, they are also in a larger sense offering a glimpse and critique of the Augustan literary milieu, the Augustan literary milieu. We'll then argue that Pope's aim is to create or fashion a self for himself in Arbuthnot, so that this becomes an exercise, as I said, in self-reflection and self-legitimization. And therefore, presents a sanitized and fluid version of himself. He will then talk about how he presents himself as the preeminent poet of the age, committed to virtue and his strong antipathy of the good to the bad, which remain continuous motives in the text. It is through this prism, then, as the great poet, the great satirist, who is the scourge of vice, and the protector of good, and who is also a generous friend, that the literary portraits need to be viewed. 
you will suggest that there are three groups. The first is, of course, the portrait of Arbuthnot as the generous physician, as a figure of generosity as a friend, and also as an arbitrary and moderate person who requests Pope Satires to move away from Lampoon towards more moderate and generalized subjects. Therefore, Arbuthnot becomes an agent through whom Pope is moving from, a, from the Juvenalian persona of the Dunciad to a more Horatian and mature satirist of the 18th century. This allusion to Horace is repeatedly built up by references to his flatterers and by the advice that he dispenses. Therefore, through the portrait of Arbuthnot, Pope is actually reiterating his own self fashioning. The same can be observed, you will argue, in Pope's portrait of the second cluster of portraits of his friends. Pope legitimizes his writing by suggesting that he is by nature a poet and claims genius for himself as opposed to poets who labor to write. He lisps in numbers because they come and publishes because the preeminent literary coterie of the period appreciate his poetry. This includes Wycherley, Etheridge, Swift and Gay. And therefore, Pope claims that this is the circuit which remains the inheritor of the classical through Dryden, Swift, and to Pope. These portraits are marked by admiration, but ultimately, all this admiration leads to his portrait as the bard of Twickenham to whom all poets must play obedience. Gay's case is more complex. Pope presents himself as the more mature guardian of the simpler gay and the nurse and protector of the poet who falls in distress, of the true poet who falls in distress. Therefore, the circle of Pope, as it were, becomes the circle of virtue and poetry, even if they are impoverished and isolated. The third group of portraits, uh, this group of portraits also includes, not the third, the second, this group of portrait also includes his parents who are represented as honest, devoted to the religion and sober. Pope also claims gentlemanly birth, even if he does not belong to the nobility. The third group of portraits, 
refer to his detractors. And every portrait is marked both by a personal grudge and a more general reflection on the literary vices of the period. In Atticus, Pope revisits his feud with Addison over the rape of the lock and Addison's refusal to edit Pope's translation of the Iliad. Addison is seen as Uh, Addison is seen as a jealous old poet who guards his coterie and refuses to allow entry to newer poets. This question of the literary coterie and literary ego therefore makes Addison Cato-like dispensing laws to his minions. The image of poetry and power is continually enmeshed in Pope's portraits. And Addison's abuse of literary merit remains the critical thrust of this particular portrait. At the same time, Pope is careful not to allow this to decline into lampoon, and his critique remains more on poetry in general rather than the individual in particular. With the portrait of Buffo, however, the satiric virulence increases. There are references to his Castilian state, his sprawling estate. There are references to Doddington's patronage of poor poets who feed his ego, his toad-like framework, and his lack of intelligence. Pope, therefore, creates Buffo as a figure who is marked by flattery or who is swayed by flattery and is a false patron and therefore makes a powerful plea like Dr. Johnson for the ending of the system of patronage. Pope's most significant satiric portrait, which is juvenilian in nature, refers to that of Sporus, Pope seems to refer to Harvey's physical frailty, his effeminacy, his homosexuality, his lack of poetic taste, and his vice ridden personality. Sporus then becomes an antithesis of the category of man, thereby reducing himself to a beast who is utterly insensitive and sexually indeterminate. Pope's poem here turns deeply homophobic and 
reflects the contemporary hostility towards sexual indeterminacy during the period. It may be argued in conclusion that Arbuthnot is about several portraits. But in reality, it is about only one major portrait, that of Pope himself. The portrait of the friends reiterates Pope's genius, community, and commitment to virtue while the antithetical portraits only serve to emphasize what Pope is not. These portraits also, however, suggest Pope's critique of the contemporary literary scenario and its inadequacies. And in doing so, Arvathnot becomes an important autobiographical index as well as a glimpse into the Augustan literary milieu. Augustan literary milieu. Right. This is the second issue that is discussed. The third issue is, of course, the structure of uh, Arbat Not. This I'll discuss uh, in lesser detail because you will probably already get the gist of what we have, we want to suggest here. We'll argue that, of course, that Arbat Not is a very carefully structured poem that is meant to present Pope's self-fashioning so that the various parts of the text cumulate to highlight Pope's self-reflection, self-possession, and self-legitimization. You will then proceed to argue that the poem is divided into several segments. Interestingly, Pope himself claimed that the poem was written in several patches. And therefore, there is a kind of a collage-like effect where the different sections are brought together. It begins, it, it is apparently an epistle to a friend, but Arbuthnot finds very little mention in the text. The ultimate structure of the poem is to build Pope's image as a preeminent poet, satirist, and a crusader for virtue. And it is to this structure that the entire or the several segments respond. Pope is also answering questions and attacks against his poetry, personality, and his parentage. He will then proceed to argue that the first section of the poet poem talks about Twickenham and Pope's grotto as being besieged with budding poets and dramatists. In this segment, Pope talks about the rampant print culture marked by Grub Street and the vogue for publishing. 
as the preeminent poet and satirist, he becomes the epicenter where every single poet turns to for money, patronage, and editorship. Therefore, the first section is one which talks about Pope being besieged both by his detractors and by his friends. And this segment builds up his almost Alexandrian presence in terms of power and Horatian existence in terms of his poetic genius. This is continued in the second section where Pope justifies his writing as born out of genius and natural ability and his publications being inspired by a coterie of friends including Walsh, Etheridge, Swift and of course Dryden. The Pope is suggesting that there is a literary genealogy of which he is part and this moves from the classical to the Anglo-Latin imagination. This is a very powerful section where Pope will also talk about himself not only as a genius poet, but also one who nurses poor poets of ability like Gay. The third segment of the poem creates pictures of negati negativity through several portraits of Atticus, Buffo, and Sporus. They are both personal attacks as well as Pope's critique of different aspects of 18th century, of the 18th century literary milieu. In Addison, he attacks poetic jealousy. In Buffo, he attacks the system of false patronage. And in Sporus, he attacks poetic instability and sexual indeterminacy. In the last segment of the poem, Pope defends his patronage and pledges to continue his father's commitment to integrity and honesty by serving virtue. Thus, you can argue that Arbuthnot, an epistle to a friend, is in reality about Pope's isolated status. Isolated by being a crusader of virtue, isolated by his deformity, yet a crusader against social and poetic deformity, and isolated by his refusal to surrender to any literary coterie. At the end of the poem, what abides is the image of the deformed poet struggling to sublimate his physical inadequacies into a relentless and vigorous quest for poetic excellence, satiric brilliance, and a con and a submission or a commitment to virtue, right? So these are the three major issues that you need to look at in Arbuthnot. Uh, that was what I had to offer. So I will stop my recording now and take your questions.